Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Your Future, Your Finances, Financial Planning, part two of our Money Foundation series. My name is Kelly Schweppe, and I'm the Program Marketing Specialist here at General Electric Credit Union. We're so glad you've joined us as we have a lot of great content ahead. Thanks to technology, we're excited to be able to connect with you on such an important topic and wanted to thank you all for tuning in from the comfort of your home, work, or wherever you may be. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Eric Waldron to introduce himself and take us through today's topic. Thanks, Kelly, and thanks everyone for joining us here today uh, for today's, excuse me, this afternoon's uh, webinar. A quick introduction of myself before we get started. Uh, my name is Eric Waldron, and I am one of the financial advisors with the credit union. I've been with the credit union now eight years uh, in my uh, current role as an advisor. Simply put, my mission is to help our members with retirement planning, investments, and risk management. And with that, we're going to just dive into today's webinar topic of financial planning basics, where we're going to take a look at some financial planning concerns. While there's no such thing as one size fits all, uh, this overview should at least assist you in thinking about uh, your own needs. So grounds to cover. First, we're going to look at and discuss, talk, talk about setting goals. Doing so is really the first step toward developing any financial plan. Second would be budgeting. This is for those basic living expenses. Creating an emergency fund, which I'm sure you have all heard about. Typically, we like to see three to six months of living expenses saved. We'll touch on insurance, risk management through life and long-term care using credit, investing in some basic investment concepts, tax planning, saving for college through 529 plans, and then the most important, in my opinion, for the long haul is the retirement planning uh, with a comprehensive plan. And then last but not least, estate planning, uh, and we'll look at uh, the rudiments of estate planning uh, and do a 101 overview on that. So let's get started. One of the first steps in financial uh, planning is setting goals. When you set goals, uh, you're defining your wants, your needs, your wishes uh, for the future. Some of your goals may be things that you want to do uh, in the not so distant future, you know, with, around the corner, such as paying off a credit card or buying a car, um, possibly a longer development for a home down the road. Uh, paying for an education for a grandchild or a child, and then possibly retiring early. So your goals are your foundation of your financial plan uh, because you need to know what you want to accomplish before you can begin saving or investing. Once you've identified and prioritized these goals, you can develop a savings or an investment strategy that can help turn your dreams into reality. And those, those dreams, again, are going to be those needs, wants, and wishes uh, that I will discuss in a little bit later in the webinar. We have a financial planning tool that we use. Uh, it's, it's financial planning software, and it's called Money Guide Pro. And like I said, I'll discuss this a little bit later. But what it's based on is just what I'm, I'm talking about right here. It's goals-based planning, making sure that we can hit those goals without running out of money uh, in retirement. So how smart are your goals? Right, SMART is an acronym uh, that stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Timely. So a goal that is specific is one that's clearly defined and described in detail. Precisely, what do you want to accomplish? I want to save for my child's college education. Actually, that is not a specific goal, but I want to save uh, Ohio State for four years by the time my daughter turns 17. That is clearly defined. The next one uh, is a goal that is measurable. Uh, you should be able to track your own progress and clearly know when you've reached it. For example, I want to retire early, not measurable, but I want to retire by my 55th birthday uh, is a goal that has an end point for you, something that uh, you can shoot for and know, hey, this is the end of the line where I set this measurable goal. Next is attainable. 
This goal is in a realist, or excuse me, a realistic and reachable goal. Obviously, goals are challenging, but you should have a fair chance at achieving them. Saying I want to have one million dollars in five years is not uh, probably attainable goal for most people. But saying, hey, I want to have a million when I retire, well, that is a different story. That is a very attainable goal. A relevant goal is one that makes sense to you, um, reflects your specific needs, your goals, your values. I want to save $25,000 for a down payment so I can own my own home. That's an example of a goal that might be relevant. Or I want to take a family cruise when I'm 50 uh, you know, in Alaska. Again, something that is relevant to you. And then timely, you must be able to set a time frame or a deadline for reaching each specific goal. I want to pay off that credit card debt by the end of next year is a goal that has a clear deadline. So writing down, prioritizing your goals is an essential step. Again, that's what we do when we uh, talk, and I'll talk about this through That Money Guy Pro when we are sitting down creating a financial plan is prioritizing your goals uh, so we can have a comfortable retirement. So on to budgeting. The first part of putting a, a financial plan into action requires you to control your flow of money. It's called cash flow. Uh, that's what a budget is all about. A budget tracks income, very simply, versus your expenses and helps you direct flow, cash flow in the way you want it to go. So to construct a budget, first account for all your income. This will include paychecks, uh, possibly a, a government benefit like Social Security, uh, any income you might have from a rental property or investments for money in the bank or possibly uh, uh, stock investments, mutual fund investments, any type of investment income. From that, you'll need to subtract your expenses. Expenses can be broken down into two categories, as you see here. Fixed are those you pretty much have to pay, such as rent, mortgage, car insurance. They're consistent. But then you have discretionary uh, expenses that are more optional, such as eating out, entertainment, uh, and vacations. And this is where we get down to the surplus. So it can be difficult to get a handle on all these numbers, especially uh, the expense item, because they do come sometimes not on a consistent basis. So you might want to track them for a while, you know, over a year period, maybe a six month period, maybe a longer period. Because one of the things I see when I'm putting plans together uh, and the most important thing I see is what that living expense is. You know, people say it's one thing, and if it's off by a considerable amount, or even if it's off by 20%, you've got to remember this is happening every month for 12 months, you know, for the next 30, 35 years of your retirement, right? Or, you know, your, your current situation if we're not talking about retirement. So being in drilling down on these expenses is very important. So an emergency fund is the foundation for any successful financial plan. Um, money that's available, you know, readily available to meet unexpected expenses. Uh, typically, what I told you was three to six months is what I like to see. That's the popular rule of thumb, but that can that can be different for each and everybody because um, you know it depends on how consistent or stable your income is. Uh, do you? work in an industry that is growing rather than having layoffs? Uh, do you have other assets that you could tap without penalty in, in, in the case of an emergency? But typically we like to see three to six months of uh, basic living expenses. And then where you keep your emergency fund is also important. Uh, you know, a jar, not the best idea. The backyard, not the best idea. You, what you wanna do is keep money in the account that it's gonna be re readily liquid uh, as soon as possible within the first two years. So rarely do you write one check equal to six months or even three months of expenses. So you might look to invest some of the other just as long as it can be turned into cash relatively quickly, um, you know, within a two day period. Uh, you know, in a mutual fund or a stock, those, those now have access uh, or accessibility within that time frame. So risk management with insurance, common types of insurance that help you protect uh, you and your assets uh, from different risks. Basically, this is transferring risk, right, uh, for any catastrophic thing that might happen, whether it's health insurance, uh, which we now call it health care plans. Most plans provide 
basic coverage uh, for common metal expense, medical expenses, prescription drugs, emergency services, hospital and extended care. We have auto insurance that has two main components, liability for property damage, uh, and then property, excuse me, liability uh, insurance provides compensation to persons uh, who would be able to sue you for personal injuries. And then we have property damage insurance, which includes collision and comprehensive coverage. Then typical life insurance, very common, very important in your younger years when you have a family, uh, loss of income. We need to cover that in case of loss of life. Then we're going to talk about property insurance. For most of us, the most valuable asset is our own. Uh, and the most common type of homeowner's policy uh, in use today covers a variety of risks that cause damage from tornadoes, uh, you know, the flood, depending on where you live. Uh, and then we move on to liability insurance, disability insurance, which is very common at the workplace. And they offer, a lot of employers offer this to you. And then long-term care. So what is long-term care insurance? This is an area that uh, I've been really uh, discussing with our members, with my clients a lot more. Uh, basically, this covers any ca catastrophic situation like a nursing home or an assisted living that could really wipe out your life savings. And, and what's interesting about the long-term care insurance business is it has changed drastically to where it is much more attainable uh, and people can wrap their heads around it uh, just with the different variations that have come out within the last, say, five to ten years. So using credit, one of my favorite lines, remember that credit is money. This is where people get themselves inherently in trouble. Uh, the three C's of credit that we'll talk about. First is capacity to repay the credit that's granted to you. They'll want to know about your income and your expenses. Um, once a creditor determines that you can repay the loan, the next question is, will you? So what's your character? Uh, to measure this, they'll look at factors that uh, measure your stability, how long you've had the same job, lived in the same place. Um, if you've used creditors before, they'll also want to look at your repayment track record. And do you pay your bills on time? You know, another part of character. Particularly for the larger loan amounts, uh, such as a car or home mortgage, a creditor might also want some type of collateral. So collateral is tangible property that secures a credit extended uh, to buy it. So if you default on repaying the loan, the creditor just simply is legally entitled to take possession of that collateral. So how creditors determine your credit worthiness? Credit application you fill out with a potential lender ask you for personal information, ask you about your income uh, and its sources. Then they may ask you also about any reoccurring uh, expenses or recurring expenses and other debts you might have. Your credit report will have a potential lender, um, wealth information about you or your payment history, and then your credit score finally comes out from all this. And it's, it's a formula that analyzes the information that you have uh, put on your credit report and compares it to your profile and thousand others like you. So that's how we develop a credit score into that three digit number that predicts the level of future risk for the creditor. Debt, using debt creates, uh, excuse me, using credit creates debt, types of debt. We have the secured and unsecured. Secured debt is backed by a lien on collateral, examples of just that I went through is your mortgage, home equity loan, or a car loan, or a secured credit card. And then we have unsecured debt that does not place a lien on any personal property to secure it. An example of this would be student loans and most credit card accounts. So important considerations is the amount you borrow obviously will have a big impact on the size of your payment, no matter what the term. Uh, when looking at an, an installment loan, the term loan, uh, the term of the loan is the length of time that you have to repay it. Generally, the larger loans have longer terms to make it affordable. And then we have the rate, the interest rate that you're charged on a debt uh, also affects the total interest you'll pay on the loan. The higher the rate, the greater the interest charge will be. So 
So let's talk about investing. Uh, do you associate investing with speculating or gambling? Do you think of it as betting on the market or trying to time the market in order to make a quick profit? Or do you think of it uh, as more of a long-term methodical disciplined approach uh, to build wealth in your future? Actually, it's a little of each. Investing involves taking up some risk, right? Also involves the desire to multiply your money over time. And especially important in today's interest rate environment, uh, with rates being very, very low, uh, you know, done properly, investing can be uh, a very good way to manage money with the goal of accumulating the funds you need in retirement. Uh, and one of the things I'll really harp on is, and what I talk about in my meetings, is discipline and patience gets you across the line at the end. It's a long game that we're looking at here. Uh, you know, don't get shaken up with short-term moves in the market. Uh, being in a in a portfolio that is invested correctly, that does not get you uh, into that uh, decision-making state where you make the wrong decision. So risk tolerance, understanding risk and reward trade-offs. So when it comes to investing, there is a direct relationship between risk and return. In general, as the potential for return increases, so does the risk. Stated another way, the less the risk, the lower the return. Um, the investment plans that, you know, that's right for you depends solely on your comfort level. I call it the sleep test. All right. So being able to put your head on the pillow knowing the market is not going to keep me up at night, right? Because 2008, people lost half their money. Well, maybe you weren't correctly allocated. Um, there, are two t there are two key questions that determine your risk tolerance. First, how comfortable you are uh, personally with risk. This is your subjective feelings on many factors, including your financial goals, where your life stage is, you know, time, you know, how much time do you have, personality and experience. You know, have you gone through other market corrections? Some investors are comfortable with high degrees of risk. Others can't tolerate it at all. Um, and a lot of people and most of the people that I deal with will fall somewhere in the middle there uh, in that middle category. Second key question is, how well is your investment plan set up to handle potential losses? So the more resilient your overall plan is, uh, with any, you know, when faced with any losses, the more risk it might be able to take on. So for example, um, time can be a powerful ally. The longer you have, the, you know, the more flexibility your investment plan might have to survive. So that's why we always, when I'm talking to younger members or younger clients, is, you know, don't worry about setbacks as we are 45 to 50 years away from your possible retirement. Um, you know, this is, again, that long game that we talk about. Enjoy this flexibility while you're younger. So growth, income, and stability. There are several key terms you'll need to understand when planning for your investments. Uh, these three words are probably familiar, but each has a specific meaning. So we all know what we want. To grow our money, right? When it comes to investing, growth means simply an investment that has the potential to grow in value. If that happens, you might be able to sell it at a higher price. Think of a stock or a mutual fund. Income comes from regular payments of money. So this would be a bond that might be paying a coupon, a dividend by a stock, an annuity, um, any of these that would regularly pay you a consistent revenue stream. And then third uh, is stability. The third potential uh, objective of an investment is, to, you know, refers to protecting your principal. An investment that focuses on stability uh, concentrates less on increasing the value, but more about principal preservation. And as much as we like, you know, to, we can't have it all. There's a relationship between growth, income, and stability. The more important one of these areas becomes, the more that you'll have to trade off in terms of the other two. So finding that balance, uh, and I do this for risk assessment uh, exams, risk assessment uh, tools that I use uh, to get you to a risk level that you are ultimately comfortable with. So income tax considerations. So we'll go through this fairly quick. Um, you know, pre-tax dollars deductions are made from your paycheck before taxes are calculated. Things such as, um, you know, your 401k or 
you know, say you're in the 22% tax bracket, really what costs a hundred dollars, you know, of after-tax dollars only costs 78 because it is going out before a deduction. So this result, you know, can be lower out-of-pocket costs because you are getting that pre-tax dollar deduction. You know, some examples are, you know, as, as you can see here, health, dependent care, such as FSA, uh, or even an HSA, transportation costs, and then of course, 401s, 403Bs. Tax deferred growth, uh, pretty self-explanatory, no taxes are due uh, until the funds are withdrawn. So wh what do we get with that, with tax deferred growth? We get compounding of money, uh, interest earns interest. Uh, in, cer in certain cases, qualified distributions are tax-free. This could be for a first-time home purchase or in uh, a medical situation. Um, COVID had this as well, uh, just uh, you know, less than a year ago. Um, some examples are 529 plans uh, on these qualified uh, distributions. Also, retirement plans such as Roth IRAs. Penalty tax applies in some of those situations if these early withdrawals are considered non-qualified distributions. So the value of tax deferral, so let's illustrate this. Let's assume you have $20,000 to invest. You put $10,000 into a taxable account that earns 6% 6, 6 per year. And you use a portion of these assets each year to pay taxes attributable to that account's earnings. You put the other 10,000 into a tax deferred account that also earns 6% a year. Excuse me. Assuming that a tax rate of 24% applies in 30 years, your taxable account will be worth 38,104. In the same amount of time, your tax deferred account will have $57,435. So the importance of tax deferral is right there in a, in a simple chart uh, and trying to get that money as much money as you can into a tax deferred account uh, as early as possible. So moving on to saving for college, I'm just going to touch on the 529 plan as uh, this is typically what I see. Set up an individual account, uh, pre-established portfolios. They actually have age-based portfolios that get more conservative for you as the child reaches that age of college. Returns are not guaranteed, so you are going to have market volatility. And then funds can be used towards any accredited program college. It could be K through 12. It also could be a student loan repayment up to certain limits. Uh, any of these can apply for those 529 plans. So you get tax deferred growth as well. And then the distributions on 529, as I mentioned earlier, are going to be tax free. Withdrawal is not used for these educational expenses will not only be subject to income tax, but also a penalty. So um, things that you want to look for, fees and expenses with each type of plan. Ohio has a very low cost offering. I use it for my son uh, with College Advantage. They've got real low cost Vanguard models in there uh, that are very easy to use, very easy to sign up. Certainly something I can help you explore. So retirement start now, right? So if we looked at this, we look at um, $3,000 a year at 6% annual. So you do this for 20 years, if you're 20 years old, and if you retire after age 65, you will have accumulated almost $680,000. Now, if you had waited until 35, got the same 3,000 in there every year, you, your accumulation is 254,000. And then if you can see at 45, it's 120,000. So obviously this is talking about the importance of starting as soon as possible, time value of money. Doesn't mean that there's no hope for you if, they're, if you're 50 years or older, it's just an example uh, of the importance of just starting as soon as possible. So retirement basic considerations, what kind of retirement do you want? Uh, financial independence, you know, obviously the freedom to pursue those goals that we talk about, what, you know, travel, hobbies, whatever it may be that is in that um, want category for you when, when developing a financial plan. The ability to live where you want, current home, vacation home, or both. 
uh, and then opportunity to uh, provide financial aid for children and grandchildren through uh, legacy planning. When do you want to retire? The earlier you retire, the shorter the period you have to accumulate the funds, um, and, the and the longer those dollars will need to last, right? So uh, Social Security also is not available, or excuse me, isn't available until 62, so you have to remember that. And at 62, you will be significantly discounted on what you should receive based on your full retirement age, um, which you, you would see on your Social Security statement, which is typically between 66 and 67 years of age. Each year that you each year that you take earlier than that full retirement age will be a haircut to your monthly amount. And then of course, Medicare eligibility doesn't begin until 65, right? So insuring is expensive these days, self-insuring. You retire at 56, 58, whatever it may be, that's great. We can't file for Social Security for a while and we have to self-insure unless you have some type of package with your ex-employer. How long will your retirement last? Average life expectancy is still uh, on the increase. Retirements will last, I will say, almost 30 to 35 years at this point. Um, we used to plan for 20 to 25 years, but um, you know, retirement need, excuse me, retirement funds need to last longer. Uh, we have nearly 100 Americans that are 100, 100 years of age today. So longevity is becoming more and more real and we need to keep these funds uh, you know, around to be able to meet all those goals that we have planned. So tax advantage savings vehicle, you know, uh, vehicles, tax deferral can help your interest money grow. You know, interest earns or interest that stays tax deferred. Take full advantage of 401ks and other sponsored uh, retirement plans. Obviously, you've probably heard this ad nauseum. You want to at least contribute up to the match that they offer at your employer. Then you can contribute to, contribute to your own traditional or Roth IRA if you qualify based on your income levels. But remember, 10% penalty tax applies for those early withdrawals except um, certain, certain circumstances. So we're gonna really go through this quickly, estate planning, uh, fundamentals, intestacy, wills, trust, planning for incapacity. So intestacy, um, this is a very common situation here where if we look at it, let's say you you know die leaving 50,000 in a savings account. Uh, who does the money go to? Without instructions from you, that's where the state would step in with their intestacy laws and direct the way it actually is passed on. And in this example, a very common example, uh, it is passed half to the wife and a quarter to each of your child or each of your children. But there's a very simple way to avoid all this intestacy and it's simple uh, as developing a will. Uh, this is one of the things we always discuss, the importance of having a will. Um, a will is the cornerstone of the estate directs how your property will be distributed, names an executor and guardian for minor children who might not be competent themselves, uh, can accomplish other estate planning goals, what we would call control from the grave, where you might have somebody that's still of age but very irresponsible um, uh, you know, with money, with finances. You can control how that money is dispersed. One of the examples also here, minimizing taxes. And then uh, must be written and signed by you and witnessed uh, very important to have an attorney to take care of this for you. You know, a lot of do-it-yourselves can run into some problems, snafus um, that you you would not want to have upon your death. So, estate planning for incapacity. This is, you know, could strike anyone at any time. Lack of planning increases the burden on your guardian, or which most likely are going to be children, right? You don't want that uh, put on to them. Uh, your guardian's decisions simply might not be what you want. Uh, you know, it's hard for a child to make a decision of, about your life, right? So having that all written out um, in, in healthcare power, uh, or excuse me, healthcare directives and power of attorneys, having all that stuff set up for you to make sure 
this is not a uh, an issue uh, or a stress for any of your family members. So with that, I'm going to, um, before we get to any of the questions, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we use here at GE Credit Union. It's, it's changed my business considerably. Um, it's Money Guy Pro. And what it does is it's a financial planning software. It's a goals-based financial planning software, as I mentioned earlier. And it, it provides a clear roadmap for you to follow in retirement to ensure your plan is on track. And this is especially important as we talked about, retirements are lasting longer, market volatility is very real, inflation is very real. So what it does is we first look at your uh, investment assets, also known as your retirement savings. Then we look at income sources such as Social Security. If you're lucky enough, you have a pension and Social Security. And then we discuss, hey, what are your unique retirement goals? Uh, and we break those down further into needs, wants, and wishes. And again, prior, prioritize those goals. And what we do is just like when you go to uh, uh, your doctor, your physician uh, for a physical, we stress test all these different scenarios as if you were to live your, you know, your life a thousand times. So we test this over a thousand different market return scenarios to see what your success rate is. And as you can see here on the screen, we typically like to see in the green or in the blue above that 80% um, level on what we call a confidence meter that we are confident as an advisor, you are confident as a retiree to meet all these goals that uh, you have you know, set out uh, in your plan. And what's nice about it, it's a great tool and guide uh, to follow through your retirement. It's very comprehensive. We don't just look into investments. We look in how to attack Social Security, how to file for Medicare. Um, we're we're going to also give you a link to a more detailed video that we have. Um, Kelly might be able to forward that to you, or you might be able to jump on the uh, Investment Services website after this webinar. Click on that video, it's two or three minutes long, and it really kind of summarizes what the plan will do for you. And with that, I will pass it back to Kelly for any questions. Yes, so as Eric mentioned, the Money Guide Pro video is up on the Investment Services page. So if you would like to take a look at that, you can find it there and watch the quick two to three minute video um, on that service. But with that, we'll go ahead and get into questions. If anybody has a question um, during the Q&A session, please use your question feature and I'll make sure to get that asked today. Um, I do have a couple to start with. Um, the first question is, what is the best age to start financial planning? So actually financial planning and, fin and having an actual financial plan are two different things in, in my view. Financial planning will start whenever you're able to earn an income and start to sock money away in a retirement plan. I mean, that you know, that could start at 15, can it start at 16. Putting a full financial plan together, like what I uh, showed here on the screen a few minutes ago with Money Guide Pro, I typically say, hey, that starts at, you know, age 45 to 50 um, to have that full comprehensive plan. But financial planning, as soon as you possibly can. And, and what I'll say is this will, you know, go back to that example I, I said of, hey, Look what happened to the 20-year-old versus the, I believe it was the 35-year-old and the 45-year-old money at the end of the rainbow. It was quite a bit different in terms of, uh, you know, assets at the end. So uh, as soon as you can on the one and then a full financial plan, 45 to 50. The next question, I believe you touched on in your presentation, but can you remind us um, what, what's a general guideline for how much money someone should plan to have in an emergency fund? Okay, yeah, so it's three to six months of what your basic living expenses, so everybody's different, right? So again, this is gonna be, hey, your Duke bill and your you know, your um, property taxes uh, broken down into a monthly number, car insurance, property insurance, food, gas, mortgage, basically anything that is what we would consider a need for you to get by and sustain, uh, you know, your household. So again, they, you know, typically what do I see? It's for, you know, certain people that uh, don't have a mortgage and it might only be 2,500 a month. People that have a mortgage, have children, it could be five, 6,000 a month. It's gonna be different for every individual, but three to six months 
of having that in a liquid uh, space in case something were to happen, like loss of job, um, a disability. Uh, that's what we would like to see three to six months. We have a couple more questions. Again, if anybody on the webinar has a question they'd like me to ask, please use your question feature. The next question is, um, if I wanted to meet to discuss some of these topics, how would I get started and how much does this cost? So yeah, uh, basically what I do is you can send me an email. My uh, contact information is up on the screen. You can give me a call, whatever's easiest. What I do is I typically send out a checklist of items to gather for, for our meeting or the meeting that's you know upcoming, whether it's virtual or live. I've been doing more virtual meetings, obviously, with uh, circumstances. But basically, I give you a checklist and a, and a budget worksheet and get you in here, look at your assets, and we can start putting a plan together for you, making sure you're allocated correctly with those risk tolerances that we talked about. Uh, and it's a free member service, you know, having... Uh, you know, this done for you is, you know, can cost two, three, four hundred bucks at other places. Being a member of the credit union, it's a complimentary service. Thank you. And then the last question is for you personally, what does your relationship look like with clients? How often do you touch base or how does that structure work? Yep. So that typically we do annual reviews, but, you know, some people want to meet me more and certainly that is going to be on the individuals uh you know their own personality so uh you know but i don't like to over meet is what i call it and that's you know making decisions on a quarterly or a six month basis again if you remember one of the things i stressed was the long game um making decisions in a six month period uh you know typically not the right thing but an annual review yes things can come up but again, if, if somebody wants to sit down and have a six month uh, review, uh, you know, it, we certainly will cater to that. I just don't want to overanalyze uh, and get ourselves into, a, you know, into trouble and not receive the outcome that we would have if we had just stayed the course. Awesome. Well, that is all the questions I have for today. If anybody on the webinar thinks of a question um, after the webinar today, Eric's information is up on the screen and will remain up there for another second or so. And it can also be found on the investment services page um, if you'd like to contact him for further information. But with that, that's going to conclude our Q&A session. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Have a wonderful rest of your day.